Um, our speaker tonight is Corey Gwynn, who will be speaking on the UX lessons of Frank Lloyd Wright. <clears throat> Thank you. Did you. Should I like talk into the mic, Colin? Do, I just, do I have to stay in front of this mic, or is it kind of cardioid? Uh, it will hear you from wherever you are. In cool. The room. All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Corey. Um, I'm a software developer at GitHub. Um, I was a UX designer, have been a UX designer in and out through basically my entire career. Um, so um, I kind of wear both hats. Uh, and I really, I really enjoy um, kind of trying to come up with talks that parallel two things that people don't think go, really go hand in hand. Um, so that's kind of why I put this talk together. So we're going to talk about the UX lessons of Frank Lloyd Wright. So um, the path to insight for this talk to me was kind of lingering. Uh, when, I was, when I was a kid, my grandparents lived in a house that was designed by um, one of Frank Lloyd Wright's students. I grew up in Wisconsin, and uh, he has a, continues to this day to have an organic architecture school uh, in Spring Green, Wisconsin. Um, it's at his home called Taliesin. And when I was growing up, I always thought this house was very interesting. It's super different than like any other space that you spend time in. Um, and, and I'd never really like put it together until I was old enough to think about complex things like that. Um, and, and I started to realize, so how special this house and this space was. Um, my grandparents live uh, along a creek and they have like one of the oldest uh, oak trees in the entire state of Wisconsin in their backyard. And my grandma's a piano teacher at a small liberal arts college, um, so she has a baby grand piano. Um, and the entire house was constructed basically around these few elements, right? Um, and it really is a different way of thinking about how you build a house, because the house was built to their life and, and the environment that they're living in. So when you're in the living room, on one side of you, there's a baby grand piano surrounded by a giant bookshelf and the roof is uh, vaulted in such a way that it creates kind of like a, um, almost like a, a megaphone that pushes the piano's music out into the space. And then none of the walls on the other side of the piano are, are flat. They're kind of shaped like this. So acoustically, the music doesn't just rebound back at you. Um, and then the whole entire back wall faces the crick and it's a giant thing of windows um, and there's just this big oak tree that's kind of right behind the space. And it's, I mean, it's amazing. Like, it's an amazing house. Um, <laughs> they're super lucky to, to have had that house, and I was super lucky to be able to spend any time in it whatsoever. Um, but growing up in this space, you kind of take it for granted, right? Because you're a kid, and you're like, woo, cars! And you're running around, and then you get older, and you're like, holy smokes, like, this is really cool. Um, so living in that space, I started and spending time in that space as I got older, I started to think about it differently. Um, and as I went through and learned about design, um, I, I gained a respect for Frank Lloyd Wright and, and this style of uh, organic, organic architecture, um, and the way that it captures the space that it's in and the way that it really affects you as a person when you're in it, um, in a way that most people don't even think about uh, in normal living situations. So we're going to talk about Frank Lloyd Wright, and we're going to talk about um, some of the things that got him to where he is, um, and some of the things that we can take from that. And uh, those those topics kind of break down as you know, Frank Lloyd Wright was evolution. He was an evolution of architecture. He changed everything. Um, so we're going to talk about how he evolved the field. Um, we're going to talk about how he seeks to understand problems. Um, I think that he really framed problems in a different way than, than most architects do and most engineers do. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, we're going to talk about people's reactions because uh, it's kind of a core part of an environment. Um, an environment is however you perceive it. So your reaction to the space that you're in is, is very central to the environment. Um, we're going to talk about context and environment. We're going to talk about consistency. We're going to talk about engineering, because I'm an engineer and a designer. Um, and then we're going to talk about 
you know, what, what does frankly right mean by organic and what does that mean to us? So, <clears throat> Frank Lloyd Wright. This is Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, that's very bright. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's okay. Uh, that's very bright also. <laughs> um, I'm, like, I'm like stuck in a space here. You are a So, Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright grew up in, in Wisconsin and after high school, he went to the University of Wisconsin to study architecture. Uh, and about, I think it was a year and a half or two years into his studies, he quit. Um, and he said, screw this, I'm done with college. I'm going to Chicago and I'm just going to start building houses. Um, so he went down to Chicago and he got, he basically muscled his way into a job at um, one of the biggest architecture firms down there um, and started working um, with a very famous architect on skyscrapers and Victorian style houses, like Pittsburgh, tons of Victorian style houses. Uh, and he hated them. He absolutely hated them. He's like, these things are monstrosities. Um, they're all decoration. There's nothing usable about them. They don't fit in the environment that they're in. And they're just a bunch of people who are rich showing off how rich they are in the worst way possible. Um, so, he was just angry at that point. Like he didn't like anything about architecture or the way that it was going. I like this quote. He said, early in life, I had to choose between honest arrogance and hypocritical humility. I chose the former and have seen no reason to change. I applaud that, right? A lot of people go through their entire career and they're like, this is stupid. And they don't do anything about it. He started trying to change it. So he was working with this architect. And he started moonlighting um, and he was moonlighting so that he could build his own homes. Um, he wanted to do something different. He thought that the state of architecture was really terrible. Um, and, you know, he, he went out and started doing his own thing. He didn't really tell his employer that he was doing that. He just started doing it. Um, but uh, he built a whole bunch of really cool homes in Chicago in Oak Park. Um, so if you're ever in Chicago, check out Oak Park. Basically, the entire neighborhood was designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, and he started out building kind of his own, like, twist on a Victorian home. Um, so this is one of his early works that he did where he was still doing Victorian-style houses. And then he switched. So this is the Nathan G. Moore house. Um, and here we see a very early Frank Lloyd Wright. And this is just a monstrosity in some ways. Um, but you, you can see him trying a lot of different ideas, right? Like, you still have some Victorian elements. He's bringing in some, like, craftsman-style stuff. Um, he's got some Japanese, like, style architecture with some of his beaming. Um, and he's, like, pulling influences from all over the place. Uh, and it's, like, this era of his work is just, like, a patchwork of different things from different places. And he's, like, sticking things together and throwing tape on the wall and trying stuff out. Um, and he has some really interesting work that not a lot of people write about and it's hard to find pictures about in this time um, because it's just monstrosities like this where he's just trying things. Um, but all this like trying stuff ends up working out really well for him because shortly after that he starts working on the Usonian homes. So this is the uh, Herbert and Catherine James house in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, I, was actually, I actually lived in Madison, Wisconsin for about 10 years, and I used to just ride my bike around and look at his buildings because there's so many there. Um, but this is where he starts to bring in a lot of um, the prairie home style. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Frank Lloyd Wright's work, um, the prairie home style is where he really starts to key or, uh, uh, add in a few key elements, right? So the flat roofs... Uh, become a thing and he, he does flat roofs because uh, pretty much everything he's building at this point in time is, is in the Midwest so it's a lot of flat plain and he wants to mimic the horizon of the, of, the, of, the, of the fields off in the distance right so the house just kind of fades into the horizon as opposed to standing out above it um, and he also does a lot of cantilevering um, so cantilevering is the idea where like you bring something out past like the edge, right? So it's kind of like a tree's branch. Um, and then he also, uh, he invented the carport. So he wouldn't have carports or garages without Frank Lloyd Wright. 
Um, he invented the skylight, more or less, at this point in time, um, and did a lot of work with uh, how he placed homes on, um, on the land where he placed homes to emphasize natural light. So a lot of the like modern, like real natural light stuff, that came from Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, he, would, he would put, like you see, lights up, uh, skylights up here to bring more natural light in. Um, if you ever get the chance to go to Spring Green, Wisconsin, uh, to Taliesin, um, he, has, he, he has a house there that he worked on basically his entire life. And he would rip parts down and put stuff up and rip stuff down and put stuff up. Um, but his studio is super interesting because I don't know how many times he changed the skylights in his studio, but the lighting in there is like, it's like the best lighting I've ever seen. It's amazing. It's, it changes your perspective of lighting. Um, uh, he also, um, uh, what was I going to say? I just lost my train of thought on my lighting rant. Lighting! Ah! Um, but yeah, so he he's really starts to coin a lot of things here. Um, a lot of big windows. Oh, he also uh, invented the um, open floor plan concept at this point in time. So everybody wants open floor plan now. That's a, that's a Frank Lloyd Wright thing. Cool. All right. So um, he goes through a rough patch. Uh, the Depression hits. He goes bankrupt. He There's like a murder at his house where someone takes an axe and kills a lot of his family. Um, his him and his wife break up. He has an affair and moves to France for a while. He has a pirate ship in a pond out front and it burns down. Um, <laughs> lots of crazy rock star living it up in the, in the Gilded Age sort of things. Um, and then he comes out of that and he doesn't have any work. He was actually um, printing architecture plans in better homes and gardens um, to help people build homes after the Great Depression for under $10,000. Um, and he, he had like a really big push where he was trying to get people to get into affordable housing, um, which if you, if you look online, you can still get some of his older floor plans and stuff and you can build a Frank Lloyd Wright house out of a better homes and gardens kit. Um, but, uh, yeah, so he, he comes through this really rough patch and everybody thinks he's washed up and he's a has-been. Um, and then he gets the contract to do falling waters which you're probably all familiar with because that's very close to here. Um, and he emerges as, as the master, basically, right? Like, you can't touch Frank Lloyd right after this period. Um, he does Falling Waters. Uh, he does the Marin County Coliseum. He does uh, the Guggenheim. Um, a lot of his really best work came out after the Great Depression, after all of his critics said that he was washed up and a has-been. So this is, this is really where he starts to shine, um, I, Falling Waters, I think, is a great example of his of his architecture style, just because of the way that it embraces the environment he's in. So, um, some of the things we start to see him do at this period of time, you can see a lot more of of the cantilever style roofs, and this is just a layered cantilever, right? And the neat thing about that is this is designed to mimic the like layered um, waterfall rock look. Um, he also starts only using materials that are available in the environment that he's building in. So, like, all the rocks and stuff that you see um, in this house are, are only available, like, in this land. And he starts going to the environment that he's in and looking for the materials that he's going to use in the house. Um, prior to that, when he was doing, um, like, some of the Usonians and things, he was, uh, he was really into, like, plywood because plywood was brand new. Like, plywood was, like amazing and a lot of people give him a hard time because it's a rough sleek but like he was like cutting edge right nobody was forming concrete like him nobody was like using these new plywoody materials um and he was he was like pushing engineering to like places where it really wasn't ready to go um but yeah so he, he turns the corner starts really embracing the environment even more um, I don't know who's been to Falling Waters, but this building is so cool. Like when you're in the living room, you can walk downstairs and be in the waterfall. Um, it's, a, it's just amazing. Um, it's amazing. <laughs> and you're, when you're in the building, you feel like you're still in the woods. It's, it's so, so great. Um, yeah. So how, how is he able to reframe architecture, right? Like how do you go from 
oh my god, every Victorian home is terrible, to I'm just going to throw shit at the wall and see what sticks, to I'm going to build the Guggenheim. Like, that's the question. Because that transformation, like, it's, it's very clear. Like, a lot of times you don't get to see an artist transform, right? Like, you see their late work. But you never see, like, how they transform from, like, uh, I don't even know what I'm doing to, oh my god, I'm amazing. And, and he's one of the few people that we can actually see that. Um, you know, there's, there's other greats. You, you can go to uh, um, many museums and, and see, like, early Picassos or whatever. But I think, I think seeing architecture brings out a whole slew of other problems than just paint on a canvas. So uh, one thing that Frank Lloyd Wright really, like, strived to do was understanding what the problem was and reframing the problem. Um, he knew very early on, like, Victorian-style homes were gaudy, excessive. Um, they didn't really think about the person living in them. Um, I think one of the more interesting things about a Frank Lloyd Wright house that you, that you experience when you go into it is that uh, he makes bedrooms really tiny, um, and he makes living spaces really big. Um, and, like, that reframing of the question, like, why are we making bedrooms where the only thing you do sleeping in them so big it's just a waste of space let's take that extra room and bring it into a living room right like thinking about questions differently um is is a big part of like why he was able to do what he he was able to do so you know we need to reframe the problems that we're looking at now how, how, let's let's transform this talk a little bit and actually start talking about how this applies to us um as ux designers so currently we're living in what I'm going to call a digital renaissance, right? Like things are going crazy. Every week there's a new device. Um, this talk is, I've been doing this talk for like four years and I, I lost the master slides. So I can't really update the slides without a shit ton of work that I'm not willing to do. Um, now you would have an Alexa here, <laughs> right? But like now you're talking to things and you're pointing at things on screens and people have like kiosks in their homes and like, the number of places where people are interacting with your product is amazing. It's innumerable. Like the complications of all these different interactions is insane, right? And then on top of that, you have like 10 marketing people yelling at you for something new. And you have users that are like, why can't I do this? And you have all these like things that are stretching and pulling you in different ways. And sometimes as a designer, you just end up like throwing shit on the page because you're trying to like get people to stop yelling at you to put things up. And you never really stop to think about like what this is doing to the grander product or what this is doing to the user. Um, and if it's actually the right solution or if you're just trying to get that marketing monkey guy off your back, right? Um, so I'm gonna make an argument that we build a lot of Victorian homes. Like we make a lot of Victorian homes. We We put a ton of windows up and we, you know, make this crazy, like, <laughs> I don't even, I don't even know what you use these turrets for, but you got these crazy turret rooms that are like weird and uncomfortable when you're in them and you can't put a bookshelf in them. And you're like, what the hell? And you know, I don't know what this thing is, but that, that was something you needed, right? Like, oh, I need more decoration on this balcony that I can't even get into because there's not a door. <laughs> like, <laughs> like what is happening? What are we doing? Why, why was this home ever built? Also, this, pro this house probably exists in Pittsburgh. I'm sure of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably down the street. Mark's looking for it right now. <laughs> so anyway, that looks a lot like this. So Windows Phone. Who remembers Windows Phone? Did anybody have a Windows Phone? Oh, did you hate it? Yeah. <laughs> My wife had one of these, and it was the worst. It was the worst. Like... Let's start, looking, let's start looking at what this thing is, right? So what do you use your phone for? Do you use your phone to make phone calls? Why is the phone call button way the fuck up here? <laughs> Whereas, like, dude riding the snowboard is huge, and he's right here, right? Like, that's really, that's really easy to push. What the fuck am I doing here? You know? Like, all, like what it, why are these things different colors? What do those colors mean? I don't, I don't know. Why, why, why does this get a picture and this doesn't? And why is missed calls really big, but it doesn't tell me how many missed calls I have? 
right? Like there's so many things about this where it's like, why, why are anything, and why is anything here the way that it is? I can't even begin to imagine. Looks like a Victorian home. Looks like that in digital form. How many people have here, here have designed this? Don't be ashamed. I've done it. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. It's like, this is like, you know, the, the AAA, or the AAA group. I'm, hello, my name is Corey and I've designed this. <laughs> All right. So, uh, let's talk about our objectives. Um, so as a designer, what are we trying to actually do? Like, what are we trying to get people to do? Well the, well, the first thing is we need to tell them what the hell we want them to do, right? Like, we need to communicate with them why they're here. Like, what are the objectives of this thing? Um, that, that, that's a real, like, heavy thing in and of itself, right? Because communicating objectives contains a lot of context. Like, you, depending on who that person is, they may be there for a different reason. Where they are on the site, they're going to be there for a different reason. Like, there's all this context that gets wrapped up in this very simple idea. Um, and then communicating importance, right? So maybe you're like got five or six things on the, pl the place where the person is. A lot of times you need to be able to figure out like what's the most important thing here. And if you're trying to communicate too many important things, like maybe there's just too many things going on in that page or in that interface or whatever it is. Uh, we need to de demystify magic. Um, Someone in the crowd always has a really good example of what this could be. I can never think of one, but like there's so many things that happen with computers where like you're doing something and then magically like this thing over here happens, right? And you're like, how the hell did that happen? Like, why is this account representative calling me? I didn't even know that that was a thing. Um, so if you're doing anything like kind of crazy and weird that the user might not expect, you need to let them know. Um, and then I think probably one of the most important things that we don't talk about enough um, is wayfinding. Um, I have a good friend who's a, a graphic designer and like his favorite thing to do in the world is to design like wayfinding signs for airports because he thinks it's like the, like the worst experience ever, right? Like trying to find your way through an airport and find anything is terrible. Um, and I think like the helping someone find their way through any sort of a digital interface is the same, like voice interfaces especially. Like, There's not enough going on in the world right now to help people figure out how the hell to get through anything going on on Alexa, right? Like you get an email like once a month that tries to tell you like how to do something new with an Alexa and then you're like trying to go into your phone and find something and then you're talking to it and like it's ordering things on Amazon that you don't want. Um, but yeah, like try, trying to help people find their way the other thing that really falls into this category that also does not get enough attention is information architecture. Um, in my opinion, information architecture is like the red herring of, of our field. Like, there's nothing really much more important than how we organize websites. Like, it took libraries a really long time to figure out the Dewey Decimal System and how important it was. And I don't think that our, our industry has figured that out yet, whatever that thing is. Um, simplifying tasks. Colin was just saying that he wants to be able to pay his water bill online and he's willing to pay more money to not have to <laughs> send a check. Um, so everything that we do is about simplifying tasks. That's pretty clear. Um, and then aiding choices. So helping people decide what is the right thing to do at this place. Um, this is kind of a checklist almost for me a lot of times when I'm, when I'm working on any sort of a UI design. A lot of times I'll just go down this list and be like, did I communicate objectives? Did I communicate importance? Did I demystify any magic? Did I help people find something? Did I simplify a task or did I aid choices? And a lot of times I'll just like ask myself these questions um, and be really mean to myself. <laughs> All right, so let's get organic. Let's apply some Frank Lloyd Wright ideas. All right, so reaction. How people react is really important. And this is something that Frank Lloyd Wright understood very well. So this is a, this is, um, if you go to Taliesin at Spring Green, they have a restaurant there that Frank Lloyd Wright designed, and this is the restaurant. Um, this roof, if you can see there's a man standing under here. 
Um, this roof is smaller than your, your average ceiling. It's, I, I was with someone that actually had a duck to go in. Um, a lot of times, Frank Lloyd Wright will try to push you through spaces by making you uncomfortable. So he'll make really low roofs. He'll make really like constricted hallways. Um, and he, he, cause he doesn't want people to like mingle in these places where he doesn't want you. Right. So like what he'll do is he'll make a really constricted hallway that opens up into a bright, beautiful room. Right. So you're just drawn to it cause you're uncomfortable until you get to that place. Um, it's like a tension, right? Like, get me out of here, get me out of here. <sighs> and there's a, there's, there's something kind of, um, I guess carnal about that. Like this, like this like fear driven, like get me through the space and then you just relax. Um, and it makes you, it makes you feel some way. Like it makes you like, like feel more relaxed when you get to that room, which is really interesting. Um, one way that we can do something similar online is just limiting the number of things that, that we have people do in a certain place, right? Um, this is going to be like a reoccurring theme in my talk, but I think we shove too much stuff onto a lot of our digital experiences, you know, like every possible action that you could ever want to do in this one place. Um, and if you can break it up, um, in a sensible way, no, it's, it's really not easy. It's not easy. I'm not going to say stand up here and say, just make a page for everything. And it's easy because you got to also get people to those places. Right. And that's the challenge, right? Like getting those hallways that get people to those places where they can do that one thing and they can do it with a lot of focus and they can do it really well. So let's talk about how you get people to those places. Revealing hallways. Um, so I was saying earlier that Frank Lloyd Wright would create these tight constricted places to shove you through. Um, what he would do if you had choices of where to go is he would give you little like chunks of knowledge about what that is, right? So if you're walking close to a kitchen, like he'll cut out his doorway so that, that like the, the hallway kind of L's and you can like see part of the kitchen. Um, or he'll like, he'll do little tricks to like open up the wall on your left just enough so that you can see into the room over. Um, and kind of give you hints as you're navigating the house as to where to go. And this is something that we can totally do, right? Like it's, if you know some, if you know some trickeries, you can, you can definitely like reveal little hints to people as they're going along. Um, one example of that is, you know, the mega drop down revealing navigation pattern. Um, this is a pattern I personally really like. Um, but just, you know, kind of chunking things into like, groups that make sense. Um, you really got to work on these words. Like that's super important. Um, and you really got to think about what pictures you put up, um, and how you organize it. But like, it's a good way to put a whole bunch of stuff in one place that lets people kind of visually do it. Um, and there's all kinds of patterns or breaking things up with tabs and stuff that most users understand. <clears throat> now, the next part of that is signifying importance. So, um, in Frank Lloyd Wright's, Wright's time, there was no TV, which just wasn't a thing yet. Um, so the, the hearth was kind of like the center of the home. Um, and one really interesting thing that Frank Lloyd Wright did that we haven't talked about is he actually would come into your house and he would design and organize all of your furniture. So he not, he didn't just do the architecture. He picked out your paintings. He picked out all your furniture. He picked out all your plates. He did everything. Um, and when he laid out where your furniture was, he always positioned it to point out importance of things, right? So if you had a really great view, um, he would design your windows to optimize the view when you were sitting. Um, and he thought about all those tiny little details. Uh, so he, he did a lot of work to signify importance by focusing on details. Um, again, really, really putting things front and center and cutting down clutter is a good way to signify importance. Pretty similar, you know, um, here's the Virgin, uh, airline site from a while ago. I really liked it when their site was like this. Cause like first page you got to, it was like, where do you want to go? And you just enter it and you go, um, since then kayaks done a similar thing, but, um, I really like this experience with travel sites because don't give me a bunch of deals and shit until you know where I'm going. Right. Like. I don't care if I can get to fucking 
Ireland for a thousand dollars. I'm not going to Ireland. <laughs> Stop trying to sell me a trip. I don't want. All right. Uh, so environment. Uh, I'm using what is around you, right? So um, Frank Lloyd Wright really strived to understand his environment. Whenever he, uh, whenever he got a new contract late in his life, he would go, he would visit, survey, spend some time there, get to know the trees, the plants, check out all the views. He would he would get a big like um, geographic uh, map of the place, and he would actually draw the house first, the outline of the house on that map, and he would pick all of the like um, materials that he was going to use from the house from samples that he got from that place. Um, so he really like first dove into the place and then said, "How can I elevate this place and make this thing live in this place as best as it can?" Um, I think a lot of times we struggle with that. One thing that I think is super interesting about like the current place of our like technolo technology architecture uh, infrastructure and like its workforce, right? It takes a really long time to understand some of the things that we do. I work at GitHub and I learn something new about GitHub like every five minutes, right? Like it's this massive thing. Um, but in, in the current day and age, people leave jobs in like two years, three years. Like that's just kind of at the point where you have enough knowledge where you can actually start to do something like that actually moves the lever on what you're working on, right? But we like get that context and then we're getting the fuck out. And it's like, what? Like you wasted all this context building time. Um, and I think it's interesting to compare to like, I don't know. It, I think about Frank Lloyd Wright, he did the same thing for so long, it took him so long to get good at it. And then I think about like Japanese ramen makers who make noodles for like seven years, right? Like my job is a hell of a lot harder than making noodles. Like, I don't know. I think, we, I think, I think sometimes we don't spend enough time understanding the environment of our product because we're so eager to move on. And that might do us a disservice. Um, Coming back to environment, you know, emph emphasizing the view was big for him. Here you can see he just built gigantic windows to mirror the size of the trees, right? You have these, you have these big, long pieces of wood that are mirroring the, um, the trees themselves. Uh, the, the lamp also mirrors, you know, a, a tree. So he, he did a lot of work here just to bring out that view and make everything feel taller. Um, this is a, this is the iPad screen from when the iPad launched. Um, I really thought that this was a pretty brilliant campaign that they did. Um, it doesn't seem like a game changer to us now, but it, put yourself back at that time <laughs> and like think of how powerful this was then, right? Like everything changes and you see someone touching a computer screen. Like at that point in time, like that was amazing. And being able to see that and see someone interact with that screen was like, oh my god, this is so cool. Um, yeah, this this period of time at Apple was so good. Um, and I'm a, I'm sad it's not that good anymore. Uh, so harmony and unity. So this is kind of a a counter to a lot of the things that we've seen Frank Lloyd Wright do. Uh, this is the Marin County Coliseum. Um, in San Rafael, California. I was lucky enough to live here for a while. And uh, this is a really different Frank Lloyd Wright piece than a lot of things that you see. He doesn't often do these arches like this. Um, and he n never uses this color blue anywhere except for in California. Um, so here we see him actually like mimicking the surrounding hills. So I don't know how many people have been to the Bay Area, but it's just big hills, like almost mountainous. So he's mimicking that with all the arches and with the, the dome. Um, and, and the blue is, of course, the ocean. The other really think, cool thing about this building is it was the prison in Battlestar Galactica, <laughs> I think. It was some sci-fi prison. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, so um, I think this is really cool because it shows that he's not like trapped in a box of always designing the same way. And it brings out that he like changes the style completely when he's put in a different environment. Um, and that takes, that takes a lot of thought and planning. Um, and and puts you, takes you from a place where you're like, 
I'm. I mean, it's, it's definitely like him, but it's not like. Not like all of his stuff looks the same, right? Like he takes his idea and he molds it into the environment that it's in. So, um, style guides are, are really useful for this, especially if you can like think about the broader user experience inside the environment that they're in. So a lot of times when we think about environment, if I'm a web designer, I'm like, oh, the environment is like, they're on my website. That's not necessarily true. Like the environment is the environment that that user is in every day, right? So if you're an iOS user, your environment is iOS, right? If you're an Apple user, your environment is OS X. If you're a Windows person, your environment is Windows. It's not that website, right? It's the thing that they live in every day. You're coming into their environment. So that's hard as, as a software engineer. And I think that's one of the hardest things about this concept of like trying to follow the user's environment because you have to think about all these different places and platforms and screen sizes and this and that and the other thing um, but it takes a lot of like from the user's side it takes a, a lot of like thinking when something isn't the same as what they're used to interfacing with every day. That's, that's like one of the cool things about iOS apps and and these native apps where they give you these like pre-built like plug and play pieces. Kind of sucks it as a, as a designer in some ways, but in other ways as a user, it's like, oh, I know what that does. Oh, I know what that does. I know what that does, you know? All right, so we want to try to be in as consistent as we can be with the user's environment whenever possible. Uh, and design is in the details, right? Like every little thing that you do is design. Um, here we see, uh, this is a lamp that Frank Lloyd Wright built and designed. Um, you can buy these for like $20 million online. <laughs> you can build it for like five. <laughs> um, but he, he would painstakingly design every single thing. And if you, like, he would go back to people's houses like five, seven, eight years after they had them. Um, and he would actually, like, check to make sure that furniture was in the place where he wanted it. And that you didn't hang up new pictures. And he would come and take them down. Like, he was a total dick. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of cursing in this code and supply talk. Who are these people? Um, anyways, uh, yeah, so um, he would design everything down to the T, like every single piece. And then, like, if you wanted to add something, like, basically it was a living style guide, right? Like, he would come back to your house and pick out new things, but they had to be in the style guide of, like, is it in, is it in the materials that are in your environment, or is it within the style of what's allowed? Um, which brings us to style guides. I think everybody should have a style guide. Um, if you work for a large organization or small organization, whatever, have a style guide. And um, set up some sort of a framework where your designers or engineers can just like easily apply those styles so that they're consistent and they're always just like, if you're doing HTML and CSS, you just add a class and boom, you get everything, right? You wanna make it as simple as possible to apply the stuff. I worked for a bike company um, prior to working at GitHub, prior to freelancing, um, with a designer. And we built, we, we rebuilt all their digital, all their, um, all their prints, all their international marking, all their national marking. We worked together on it. And we mirrored the digital and the international, everything. We mirrored it. It all had the same style guide. Um, and that made so many things so much easier. Um, so if you can if you can do it, take the time, and use things like Pattern Lab or whatever your cup of tea is to, you know, make it easy to put these things together in composable modular pieces, so you can use them as in as many scenarios as you can think of. I don't know if this is relevant anymore. This is old. Whatever. <laughs> pick your pick your whatever you like. Changes every five months. Um, I don't really care what it is, honestly. Just pick something. Um, so engineering. Uh, I'm a software engineer. Um, like I said, I've been a UX designer on and off many times. Um, but I think that 
if you're if you're a designer you should at least understand like the craft of the person that's making the thing you're designing you don't have to be like a rock star engineer you don't have to like go out and write the next machine learning algorithm that's going to change the world but i think you should learn a little bit about programming and, and like just learn a little bit about what the people that are building the thing that you're doing how they talk, how they communicate, what's important to them. Frank Lederet was actually a really good engineer. So this is uh, the Imperial Hotel in Japan. And if you notice, this is the Imperial Ho Hotel in Japan, and this is a whole bunch of ruined buildings. These are all destroyed buildings. There was a gigantic earthquake in Japan around this time. Um, Everything pretty much either fell down or burned to the ground. The only building that was left standing was the Imperial. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright actually designed this building and he understood earthquakes were a problem. So he built the entire building to modulate at the proper frequency so that it wouldn't fall over in an earthquake. He was an incredible engineer. He understood how to do things with plywood before anybody else did. He understood how to, to cast concrete before anybody else did. He was able to do a lot of what he could do because he was such a good engineer. So why is this important? Um, this is an old Flipboard picture. So I don't know if anybody remembers, but Flipboard decided to change their entire website interface to be SVG. And they did this because they really, really thought that it was important that the website refresh at 60 frames per second so that it matched the refresh speed on their iPad app. And some designer came up with this crazy concoction of an idea, and the site was plagued with bugs for months and months and months. This is a very simple thing. This is how to reset your, your, email, or your, uh, your login, and like you couldn't see the input box ever, so you couldn't reset your password. Um, and this bug persisted for God, I, I saw it for about four months. Um, and I emailed them about it, and they're like, we can't figure out how to do it. <laughs> um, and if this was HTML, it would have been really easy, right? It would have been like two lines of code, and it would have been done. Um, I actually had to go to their support person and have them reset my password because I couldn't get in. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the, des the design choices that are made by designers impact engineering and vice versa, right? It's a give and take. These, these two groups are always at odds with each other, but it's super important that they work together. And a lot of that is communication, um, as the world so vividly shows us today. So uh, let's talk about what organic is. Um, this is the Mon Monona Terrace in Madison, Wisconsin. So anybody been to Madison? Yeah. My people. So I'm from I'm from the Madison area. I love Madison. But when you drive in on the John Nolan on John Nolan Drive, this is like the backdrop of the city that you see, and it's beautiful. Um. <clears throat> so, uh, what is organic design for us? Um, you can debate me about this all day. That's fine. But this is this is kind of what's important to me. So, I think that it has to be empathetic, right? Everyone that's coming to whatever you're doing has like five minutes in their day because they have six screaming kids yelling at them and a job that they can't keep up with and they just want to get their fucking banking done, right? Like, that's the situation that they're in. They don't... <laughs> Marketing is, is unempathetic, always. And your job as a designer is to try to bridge that gap, right? Because I don't care where you work. Marketing is in your face. Like, that's just the way it is. Um, so as a designer, I think that you're the you're the user's face. You fight for the user. You're like the guy from Tron. Um, it should be contextual. Like everybody's in an environment. Like it does, Like their environment might be. They have five screaming kids yelling at them, but their environment is also like, I'm on a laptop, or I'm on an iPhone, or I'm on a tablet. Like. If you're on an iPhone, it's really hard to do a lot of things, and you can't give me a ton of options because my finger is only this big, and my screen's only this big. So, like, try to understand where the user is and how they're coming at you, and be empathetic to that situation. Um, problem and task driven. <laughs> your main goal in life. What is your main goal? Like, what are you trying to do in this place? 
get rid of everything else or try to shove it out of the way. <laughs> Focus on that thing. And then communicative, right? So wayfinding, um, context, prioritization, all these things that we talked about, giving assistance, etc. cetera. Um, and that's it. So um, if anybody has questions, if anybody just wants to like be like, I love this Franklin Drake building. Yeah. So I was actually having a discussion that uh, was kind of inspired about by uh, seeing that this was coming up, but uh, is Craigslist good design? <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually have, I have, I have big feelings about Craigslist. So I used to work in the news industry. Um, and I worked in the news industry at a point in time, the company I worked for, we were basically trying to save news. Like that was our goal in life, right? Because um, what had happened, all the like local newspapers made all their money on, this is going, this is going way off the deep end. Um, <laughs> just gonna. <laughs> I'm a journalism major. Uh, journalism. Okay, so all the local news companies used to make all their money on um, ad, li ad listings for local sales and things like that, right? This is how they made their money. Um, and this is how they finance good long-form journalism. And I worked for this company and like we basically just floundered around for seven years trying to come up with revenue generating models for, for news companies because they were just laying people off left and right. The quality of journalism was going down. Um, and what ended up happening was I, was I was at the very early stages of like clickbait war and it got real ugly real fast. And it's like, everybody's reading bullshit. And like, this is the most inflammatory crap you can throw at people. And this is what they click on. And it was like this dog eating its tail of nastiness. And I blame Craigslist. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I mean, they took, they took like, <sighs> they didn't have another funding model. They didn't have anything else. Like people stopped paying for newspapers. It was like classifieds were it. And it paid for all of our news. Like it paid for, and it's, it's like now they're, instead of being like at the whims of some dude selling a bicycle out of his garage, paying your bills, you're at the whims of big oil and big pharma, right? Which changes journalism fundamentally. Anyways, that's, that does not answer your question. <laughs> at all <laughs> um but is craigslist good design i think craigslist is very usable design okay. all right do you agree well i mean <laughs> I, I personally like I, you open it up and I, I have friends who are design i like when i program i mostly make console apps which is why i'm here because <laughs> i have no idea how to do ui <laughs> see something um but uh I, I said this i was like wait is is craigslist good design because like i come from like a background where i, I really like the idea of something should be simple and like it should do one thing and do it well sort of mentality um and craigslist seems like that like where they have i think i think craigslist is really simple when you're trying to find something and i think it's really simple when you're like trying to like figure out what you want to buy I think Craigslist falls apart when you're actually in the transaction. And then it's just shit, right? Because you're like, I don't know if anybody's seen this like Facebook thing going around, but there's like a, what it's like to buy uh, a, an iPad on, on Craigslist video going around. And like this dude shows up with like a bodyguard and they're, <laughs> and they're both like, they're like, give me the money, give me the money. And like the one guy's got a bat, you know, and then they, and then they, and then they get done with the transaction. They're like, cool, man. Thanks. Yeah, this is great. And, uh, I mean, coming back to the talk, right? Like Craigslist doesn't completely build an environment, right? Like neither does eBay. Like none of these online things make the purchasing experience complete, safe, and good. There's always a point where you're like, fuck. And yeah, I don't, I is Craigslist good design to a point, but no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I wanted to ask, so uh, as designers or as a designer, like a large portion of my job is related to gaining uh, stakeholder consensus. So 
to trying to understand user needs and, and understanding business goals and making sure there's a line. Um, and it seems like there was uh, little to no collaboration or um, uh, room for flexibility in terms of his vision. So do you think ultimately like his inability to uh, consider other stakeholders' needs led to the ultimate success of his work? Or were there times where um, you know, bridges were burned or projects were stopped because I'm just curious. So, I mean, his work evolved a lot. In some of his early stuff, he gave people a lot of flexibility, right? Like, when he wasn't a known designer, like, yeah, yeah, we'll work with you on everything. Um, when he was doing his really great work, which was late in his career, he was, he was not flexible. Um, I think that I'm a big fan of some of his Prairie Homes, right? And I think there's definitely a place for for those things. Um, I, I really celebrate the fact that he worked with uh, like Better Homes and Gardens to put out plans that were usable by everybody for building houses under $10,000 right after the Great Depression. Like that is that is A plus work. Like that's one of my favorite Frank Lloyd Wright fan thing, like things. Um, but that's contextual, right? Like when he designed the Guggenheim, he had something very different in mind. And he's he was an artist then as opposed to a designer for someone else. So I think, I think there's a context to, to these things in that, like, sometimes someone's hiring you to be an artist, and sometimes someone's hiring you to help them. And I think those are different situations. Um, I don't feel like I'm answering your particular question in that I feel like you're looking for, like, some sort of advice, maybe? Yeah, no, no, no. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. I'm just thinking, like, um, as a creative type, it, we usually find ourselves uh, weaving a lot of perspectives in to, to please a lot of people, and it seemed like maybe he was more, like, focused on his own vision, so. Yeah, for sure. I mean, definitely later in life, he was focused on his own vision completely. To, a little so, bit to that comment, there was, um, I once heard somebody from Bosch say that, uh, you design for the, the like five percent of people that really have a special need, and then like the the ninety five percent of people just sort of fall in because they they're used to using something. But I I was wondering, I find that a lot of the time as an engineer being told to you know input, build somebody else's design, that when you're designing for all the five percent, you end up with something that's not really usable by anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering if there's a way that you can approach striking that balance. Well, I mean, one of the one of the things that I've used in the past when when approaching this situation, and this is not necessarily a Frank Lloyd thing; it's more an approach that I've used, um, is try to segregate people into like super user, not super user things, and be like, okay, cool, you have a five percent problem. Like, we can approach this with documentation, or we can approach this with, um, you know, like power moves that break it off into this corner where it doesn't affect most people because you're one of those five percenters and you're probably not served by a lot of other people, so fuck you, go over there. <laughs> you know? I don't know. That's, that's my approach. I don't think there's a good architecture alignment there. <laughs> so um, you were mentioning about like organic design and context, mm -hmm. and I think it's funny to me that you like put it at, like, okay, there's iOS, there's OS, but whenever I was thinking about that, and I just wanted to hear your thoughts on this train of this train of thinking. Is like, well, what if the user's sitting down? What if it's an enterprise software where they're going to be sitting at a desk? One of the mm -hmm. one of the things, if you're from the Pittsburgh area, like the UPMC computer kiosks, yeah. I think is an interesting. And I, I was just wondering, like, you know, I, I think that that's a crucial part if you can kind of compartmentalize that because mm -hmm. is this app supposed to be? you know, enjoyed laying down on a couch or is it, right. you know, while you're driving and it's supposed to be talking to you? It's something I've thought about a lot. Um, we're getting into the area of my opinions again, which are... <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly kind of I, I um, think that's where the, the organic design really yeah. starts to flourish. So I think, I think the introduction of more sensors, um, 
is probably one of the most underutilized pieces of technology from the user experience realm of things that exists. I also think that there's probably good reasons for that, which brings me back to like, you need to be an engineer and a designer, mm -hmm. right? Like a lot of, I'm an engineer and a lot of these interfaces, like building around them requires just so much legwork, right? Because you need to design things six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 different ways. Mm -hmm. um, it's almost like people with like 3D Maya sort of experiences, like, putting yourself into the environment completely have like a benefit there, but I don't think that that's the way it should be. Right. Like I do, I do some like smart home things. Um, and I always feel like there's just a, a little bit further that I want to go. Right. Like dim my computer when the lights go to this place and like have these sensors, like know when I'm laying down and like change the angle. Like there's all these little things that I want to do. Um, but I, I think it's, I think it's one of the great unexplored kind of difficult over the horizon things in the UX world. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that is like just not knowing what the fuck to do with it. Right. Like just not having the time or space to experiment or not seeing like the idea that like catalyzes and crystallizes it for you. Um, I've often thought like, I'd love to go back to grad school and just like play with shit for like three years and like see what the hell came out of it. Don't, don't give me any sort of curriculum. I just want to like fuck around with sensors. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think you're right. I don't, I don't think you're wrong. Well, well two ideas that I want to bounce off, if that's okay. Yeah. It's like, um, I never really thought about it until you mentioned it, but like responsive design with sensors, um, more than just responsive design for screen size or other accessibility yeah. features. And um, another more simplistic idea, again, with the kiosk example, is non-digital uh uh, features, you know, aka like, well, and I'm sure that's a part of some people's process is like having a something that's printed out on the side of your uh, monitor that gives you instructions on how to use the software and extending it beyond the software itself, the media, the medium itself. Yeah, for sure. I mean, even going beyond that, right? Like, I like to watch Star Trek. We're not at a point yet where I can like reliably really talk to my computer. Right. Like we can kind of talk to our computer, but it's not there yet. Right. I think there's there's a lot to come. Thanks. I think I'm going to jump on top of that, which is the thing that, that bothers me is that how important I said, what you wrote earlier, context and environment is and everything. And the sensors, the more you can know about someone, the more, you know, in that context you can get and the more sensible defaults you can create. Yes. But the problem with that is, I think as part of why it's not so heavily used, is if you trying to get to know someone really well and trying to get the, the perfect thing for them, when you get that wrong, it's much more off-putting. Right, but the context, <laughs> I, I alluded to it early on in the talk, but the context is, is also the person's reaction, right? And each, in, in architecture, it's harder because you have a lot of people moving in and out, so you kind of just build for the people that live there. Mm -hmm. Like, we need to try to build for the people that live there too, yeah. right? Um, yeah, I mean, the world of Apple is like sensible defaults, right? And the world of Windows is like, do whatever the fuck you want. <laughs> um, and neither neither seems to be quite what everybody wants, right? It's the 95-5% rule again that we ran into earlier. Um, but yeah, I think I think you're you're right. Like, the the more you know about something, someone, the more you have an ability to be uncomfortably wrong. But I think that in the world of computers versus like the world of building a home, we have the advantage of like the person working with the computer, right? And as like machine learning becomes more of a thing and we get stronger processors on our computers, like we should be able to do things where the computer works with the person to find the right kind of comfort space, I think. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. This may have an analogy. Yeah, I think I can stretch it to an analogy. Nice. Probably. That's what this whole talk has been. <laughs> so, <laughs> I have visited uh, Baltimore, 
Quality Waterhouse. Okay. I think it's a remarkable work of art. Yes. Uh, you couldn't pay me to live there. <laughs> yeah, probably not. <laughs> and I'm claustrophobic. Yeah. And so, like, actually, I, I quite angered the uh, tour guide because I wouldn't go through the hallways with the group. Yep. I would wait till they cleared that that hell spawn <laughs> place mm -hmm. and then walk by by my yes. briskly by myself. Yes. Or the bedroom with the concrete ceiling that's approximately three inches tall and swoops down just to make sure it's really clear that there's thousands of pounds of things. Yeah, know, for things. sure, for yeah. sure. And so accessibility is kind of like that. Things that look, I have a friend who has vestibular problems and stuff that looks cool to me uh, is triggering for her. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's tons of accessibility issues. I used to work with a, when I was, when I was learning, um, to be a designer and a programmer, I was working at a learning technology center and my like, it was an internship, so my mentor was blind. And I would design things, you know, and then he would check them out with the screen reader and be like, no, 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 <laughs> fuck no. <laughs> and then I'd have to redo everything. Um, and that comes back again to context, right? Like context is a personal thing. Um, and one of the most challenging things with user experience today, in my opinion, is that we haven't really dealt with that very well. We haven't. Mm -hmm. And we don't have the tools to do it. Um, what did you mean exactly by the Dewey Decimal System and how you thought that hadn't been created yet? <laughs> well, OK, so I think the closest equivalent to the Dewey Decimal System that exists today is Google, right? where you just search everything and it tries to guess what you want based on you know, what past people have clicked on and what's popular based on their page rank algorithm. Um, the Dewey Decimal System went through many, many, many versions before it became the Dewey Decimal System. Um, Google's fine, you know, but we've seen through the recent, recent election cycle how bad Google can be also. Um, so I just don't think that we're there yet with information architecture. Um, it involves too much, too much user recognition of whether or not what a person is getting is accurate and correct. And it perpetuates too much shit, right? Like how many... How many contradictory articles could I find in five minutes on climate change? Yeah. Well, the, the term thrown around a lot after the election was echo chamber, right? That too. People get into their echo chambers and... Yeah. The, the whole information sharing network has lost something, in my opinion, as we've moved from trusted centralized sources to decentralized anything. Um, there's a democracy to that that is wonderful and amazing, but it's not necessarily really trustworthy and it's easy to manipulate. And there's not a lot of responsibility currently on certain parties' parts to assist with that because there's no money in it. Dewey, Dewey Decimal System works without money. <laughs> Although you can write a shit book, but... <laughs> I think that's kind of my point. You're welcome. I don't know if I answered your question in a satisfactory way. Well, I mean, you, you said that you, you didn't know what would replace. Oh, I don't claim to have any answers. Yeah, sure. <laughs> if, I, if I did, I'd have millions of dollars, trillions of dollars. Or I'd have a startup that failed. Because <laughs> that probably is out there, too. Cool. All right.